But you do that all the time Take this gift, a simple gift An offering so small Send it to the little ones Who need it most of all May it be the perfect gift An answer to their Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning here in our sanctuary at First Baptist Church. We welcome those that are watching uh, online through Facebook or YouTube, listening on the radio, or possibly listening online on 96.1 here in Childress. Uh, we're glad that you're here. It's our purpose today is to bring everybody together, whether we're listening, watching, or right here in this sanctuary, to bring everybody together to worship our Lord and uh, we're just glad that you are here hope that you received and a bulletin on your way in plenty of announcements in there that uh, especially Operation Christmas Child we'll talk more about that at the end of our worship today and um, our offering boxes are back at the back and uh, if you have an envelope that you need to uh, get to us in the church office you can certainly put that in the offering box on your way out this morning. Got some real good songs of, of uh, praise and encouragement to sing today. This first one is a great old hymn of gratitude, a great old hymn of praise uh, for the atoning death of Jesus. You know, back in the mid 19th century up to about the 1930s of the 20th century, Charles Gabriel was uh, uh, probably the, the king of gospel music or hymn writing. And that was back when he first started. That was back when a lot of the hymns were deeply meditative and very theological. 
And uh, then they started having revivals with uh, D.L. Moody and Billy Sunday and, and, and the music changed and Charles Gabriel was a part of all of that because the songs became more uplifting. They became uh, more fun to sing, highly energetic. And this song that we're getting ready to sing is a song just like that one that he wrote because it focuses on one single thought, one single emotion, emotion and that's just that awesome amazement of what Jesus has done for you and me. I stand amazed in the presence. We're going to sing all four verses. They'll be on the screen. Let's stand together as we begin this morning. Three and four. Sing with us. I stand coming out of the tomb, and he did it all for you and me, and he did it all because he loves us. Nobody will ever love us any more than how much Jesus loves us. Sing this with us. Morning, I see you in the sunrise every morning.
final song we've sung many many times over the years and uh, it all comes my chains are gone comes from psalm 107 which basically is a song of thanksgiving and these uh, are part of the verses there in psalm 107 uh it says this some of you were prisoners suffering in deepest darkness and bound by chains because you had rebelled against God most high and refused his advice. You were worn out from working like slaves and no one came to help. You were in serious trouble, but you prayed to the Lord and he rescued you. And this is what verse 14 says in Psalm 107. He brought you out of the deepest darkness and he broke your chain. The church said, Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was.
so that we could spend all of eternity forever and ever with you. Thank you for your great love for us, incomparable, unmatchable. I pray now as uh, Brother Parker comes in just a few moments, Lord, it will be your voice speaking through him, so help us to listen to every word. We thank you for this time together. It's in your name we pray and we all say it together. Please be seated. You know, um, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our kids for Children's Church right now. And um, I do want to encourage you to just to take these next few moments as Beverly gets ready to to play before Brother Parker comes. Just take these few moments to, let's all of us, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear from the Lord.
My back is fine. It's my knees. <laughs> Good to see you today. And uh, I was thinking of a song as you were playing that God will take care of you. Some of those we don't sing enough anymore. And one of them that kind of goes along with our sermon today. I'm going to be looking at the, the second letter in Revelation chapter 2 to one of the churches of Asia Minor. The suffering church. What does Jesus say to a suffering church? And I thought of the song there just a moment ago. Uh, we don't sing it anymore because it's not, I don't know, it's been a long time since it's in the hymn book, but are ye able, said the master, to be crucified with me? Yea, the sturdy dreamers answered, to the death we follow thee. That was the guys before Jesus died. Oh, yeah, we're going to follow you to the bitter end. And they thought they were going to get some kind of fancy kingdom along with that. And they didn't realize uh, by the end of the first century, all of them would die violent deaths according to tr tradition, except for John the Apostle, who lived out to be an old man on the Isle of Patmos and later finally got to go back home to Ephesus and, and uh, reflect back on his life. We looked at the first letter last week that John wrote that Jesus revealed to him in Revelation chapter 2 about the church at Ephesus. In my opinion, and, and I'm not a great Bible scholar, but I'm, I'm kind of one of those that says I can see dual uh, fulfillment in just about all Scripture. Uh, Isaiah 53 today, we saw the suffering servant and there's no question in my mind who Isaiah was talking about there, about the suffering of Jesus. And I thought, you know, there is no suffering we're ever going to experience that ever comes up to what he suffered. You agree with that? How I many of you saw, and you didn't, we didn't see it, but we saw the about to happen, ISIS a few a couple of years ago when they were getting with it in 2016 or 17 when they had those Coptic Christians from Egypt on the beach there in Libya and were beheading them uh, on live, tell, you know, videoing it, showing it to the world. And we thought, oh, that's terrible. That's nothing compared to what Jesus suffered. They died. They died. Jesus died with the weight of the entire world on his shoulders. But as Christians, and, and, and a couple of weeks ago it was... Uh, Day of prayer for the persecuted church. You got a Bible, Mark. Lois handed me this while ago, and I got to reading it and said, What is persecution? Any hostility experienced from the world as a result of one's identification with being a Christian. And there's what, some 190 nations around the world. 60 of them are, in, are countries where Christians face persecution from the government, from neighbors, from family, from friends and uh, even physical torture. Uh, the top ten persecuted churches. Number one was, is North Korea, uh, Iraq, Eritrea in North Africa, Afghanistan, Syria, Pakistan, Somalia, Sudan, Iran, and Libya. Those are the top ten. Only one of them is communist. We used to fear the communists, you know. Nine of them are those peaceful, anyway, uh, that peaceful religion that would like to take over the United States as well. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of a conspiracy theorist. I believe there's a conspiracy to take over the world in America. Jesus said it. He said, the devil's come for what reason? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's his conspiracy to take over the world. He's alive and well, isn't he? But Jesus said, but I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And greater is he who's in you than he that's in the world. So whatever comes our way, we're on the winning team already, okay, in Christ. Persecution may come. It may, in fact, probably will. 
G.K. Chesterton, a theologian, I like what he said. He said, Jesus promised his disciples three things. You know, he said, are you able, said the master, to be crucified with me? And they said, sure thing, boss, we're ready. Here's what Jesus promises Christians. It's not wealth. It's not health. It's not all of those things. He said, you will be completely fearless. You will be absurdly happy. And you will be in constant trouble. And I thought about that. I said, am I completely fearless? You know, what's going on in our world today would want to create fear, doesn't it? So I like the little mass that says, my faith, faith over fear. True. We need faith. Faith that in the, you know, in the church is persecuted today. Uh. It's being persecuted so subtly by this crazy virus, isn't it? Churches having to go to law, uh, some states having to go to court to get more than 10 of them together. Aren't you glad you live in Texas, Panhandle? <laughs> Where we don't pay attention to most laws anyway, but uh, we're kind of lawless sometimes, aren't we? Come and take it, you know, but, uh, but we need to be fearless. And it could come to the point where they come and they say, do this, do that. But we need to be fearless in our faith. And we need to learn to be, I thought, absurdly happy. Are you happy? And I mean just always, you know, laughing. But it means in the midst of circumstances that you're not going to let any cir- Paul said, no matter what the circumstance is, I'm content. Happiness is really contentment. It means no matter whether you're rich or poor, you're black, you're white, you're Greek or Scythian, male or female, Gentile or Jew, you're happy, you're content. And then that third one, in constant trouble. Now that's not, I've been in trouble all my life. That's not what I'm talking about, you know. Uh, In trouble for your faith. Have you ever had trouble for your faith? Well, we're going to see today that, that if and when that comes, uh, what we're to do about it. But looking back here in Revelation chapter 2, let's just read the letter, the second letter that Jesus writes to the church at uh, uh, Smyrna. Smyrna. Beginning in verse 8 of chapter 2, he says, And unto the angel, and this is Jesus telling John what to write down, to this church, and I believe that these were churches, real seven churches in Asia Minor. John wrote these, this letter and sent it out to all of them. And here's what he says to you, Smyrna. These things says the first and the last. Who's that? First and last? Jesus. Alpha and Omega. Who was dead and is now alive. I know your works and the tribulation or the testings, the afflictions, the poverty that you're experiencing. But you are rich. Interesting. In the midst of their poverty, they are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those that say they are Jews and are not. But they are of the synagogue of Satan. Right there in the midst of the synagogue. In the midst of the church, Satan was working. I told you we're going to be looking at seven letters to seven churches. And every church in America today probably has bits and pieces of any one of them, but there were those who were in the, within the church, within the synagogue, who were not really of Christ. He says, fear none of those things that you are, that you are suffering. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you'll have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Be faithful, and you get a crown. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. 95 A.D., when John is writing this. At that time, God is giving the church a futuristic 
glimpse of things to come, I believe. Now, sure, there were seven churches that needed to hear these seven thoughts and letters. But I'm of the opinion that uh, uh, the, the uh, historical premillennialists, whatever you want to call them, I, I, I think that God is using this to show that there were going to be, and it, and it kind of fits well in church history, that seven church periods. And I believe we're in the last one today. There's not four more to come. Uh, there's not names, there's not dates put to any of this, but the first letter that, that, that John writes is to the church at Ephesus. The church from the time of Pentecost until he's writing this has been a busy church, active, actively working, working, working. Yes, there's been some persecutions. Yeah, Paul lost his head to, under Nero. Uh, Nero had already used Christians as torches on crosses, but it hadn't hit the whole empire yet. And right after John wrote this, in, beginning in 100 A.D., persecution began like no other, as we'll see in just a moment. But I believe that these letters are telling us about the next, well, for John, it was future. For us, it's history. It's past. And we can look back and see how each of these letters fits into a certain period of church history. Now, I know you, can, you have to kind of work it to get it to fit out. But it doesn't matter if that's a, God uses it. And so as we look at this letter, he's writing to the church at Smyrna. Smyrna was a city on the Aegean coast. It's in Turkey today. As the, the name of the modern-day town is Izmir. The word Smyrna, listen to that word. Take the S off. You got Myrna. It comes from the same root word that, remember the, the gifts that Jesus got at his birth? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Same root word as, that Smyrna comes from. And the word was, it's a spice uh, that the wise men brought to Jesus. It's a spice that's used in burial, at burial scenes. Uh, they say it, I'm, don't know that I've smelled it. I say it smells wonderful, but you, you only get the smell of the myrrh. I don't even know what a myrrh is. Anybody know? Is it a plant? Whatever it is, and it's pretty, and I think it's, uh, it's kind of rare, like frankincense and myrrh. They're kind of rare, but the only way you can get the, the aroma, the, the, the fragrance, is when you crush it when you grind it, and then that aroma begins to permeate a room. Smyrna is the persecuted church that Jesus is talking about here. It's a church that's living in poverty and affliction. And just like myrrh, it was being crushed. But Jesus says something wonderful is going to come from that. And to the persecuted church, Jesus is talking to them and telling them to, uh, well, first of all, he says, I am the first and the last. I know what's going on in between. And he died, he came to life, he conquered death. Jesus, who did all of that, is saying to that persecuted church, I know your afflictions and your poverty. I feel your pain. He knows it like no other. And he says, but you're rich because of it. In other words, they, could, they can take your job, they can take your house, they can take your life, but they can't take your true riches. They can't take your soul. So as we look at this little letter here, and it was about 100 A.D. that the Caesars, the Roman emperors, began in not just in Rome itself but throughout the Roman Empire to persecute Christians and they began to blame Rome was on the decline and so what do you do you got to find somebody to blame you know Hitler had his whipping post you know it was the Jewish people everybody wants to find somebody to blame Christians are real easy to blame because they don't they're not supposed to fight back right uh, but the Caesars began to persecute Christians. The burning at the stake became empire-wide. 
uh, that's when the real catacombs began to emerge underneath the city of Rome where the churches went underground to have church. And they began to use the Christians for sporting events, you know, with the wild animals in the, in the arenas. And, uh, but they were driven underground because of that. But Jesus says in verse 10, he says, Don't be afraid about what's about to happen or about what you're suffering. And he says, I tell you that the devil is going to put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Now, that's an interesting, people, what, ten days? Well, I could bear ten days of anything. I could, looking back, I could bear ten days of COVID, couldn't you? Compared to ten months or ten years, we don't know how long this is going to go on. The Christians didn't know how long the persecution of the church was going to go on. But when he says ten days, what a... I'm sure that John didn't know what was going on with it. The church that read the letter didn't really understand what was going on. But historically, looking back on it, there were from 100 A.D. until 300 A.D., about 325, that Christianity actually became the official religion of the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. But between 100 and 300, there were 10 Caesars, ten emperors, who would, one would come on the scene, he'd start out kind of slow at Christians, start persecuting Christians, and then he'd get tired of that and he'd go down. Ten of those guys brought Christians before them, burned them, torched them, fed them to the lines for ten different Roman emperors. Finally, Constantine was the last to do that. Coincidence? I don't know. The ten means something. And, and Jesus, I believe, was telling them not just ten minutes or ten days or ten hours or whatever. Ten emperors, ten periods of time. It's going to go on. He didn't promise us an easy road. And it's going to, this is three, uh, 200 years that went on. Well, anyway, he said to them, you're going to be faithful to the point of death. And then I'll give you a crown of life, the victor's crown. And said, whoever has ears to hear, listen to this. And the one who is victorious will not be hurt by the second death. What is the second death? That's the one that can send you to hell. I love to tell people, you know, if, about being born again. If you've been born once, physical birth, and that's it, you don't know any other birth, you're going to die twice. You're going to die physically, and at some point in the future, you will die for all eternity in hell. That's not me, that's the Bible. Okay? But Jesus said, be born again, and the second death, hell, can't touch you. If you've been born again, you're in a new family. You're going to still die because you were born of Adam, right? We're all here related to Adam, you know, that guy. Physically, we are going to die, short of a rapture or short of Jesus coming back or however he wants to end it. But we're going to physically die. I'd like to get out on, on I, I'm all for the rapture because I want to not pay the funeral director, you know. I want, I want it. But I will face physical death short of that. But I'm, that's it. That's just physical. He says, what's that? I, I don't know. Well, this one's getting pretty worn out, you know, and I'm ready for a new one. A and we'll get a new body, and the second death won't affect us. That's what Jesus is saying. You will be victorious. Only one death, and that's what he's talking about. With you may suffer. We watched in Sunday school this morning the passion of Christ. That's one of the most graphic pictures put the music on this talking about the suffering that jesus mel gibson did a great job as you said it's not it, it doesn't really it in five minutes you can't really give it jesus suffered right 
No amount of suffering we can do is ever going to compare to what he suffered for us. And when you read the letter to Smyrna, you're faced with, you see, the persecution. They were persecuted by their own people as well uh, within the synagogue, within the church. You know, sadly, Jesus said some of the greatest persecution is going to come from your own family, from your own friends that could come to that. In this second memo to the church, Jesus talks about suffering. And, and, and back in Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, he reminded them, Blessed are those of you who are persecuted what, for doing right, for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you are reviled and they persecute you and they say all manners of evil against you uh, falsely for my name's sake. Read by this, this is the longest blessing he, uh, in the Beatitudes. He said, and rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And of course, he's talking about righteous suffering. Peter, Peter warns, warns us about not, don't suffer for doing evil. You know, that's, some of you might suffer for evil, but suffer for righteousness. And here Jesus is given a word to this church. We don't know when this church started. Little pocket of believers, probably meeting here in Smyrna in a synagogue. That's kind of where they met. Tried to meet at first. They tried to offer, you know, when when they when Paul and the other apostles would go out. They tried to start by meeting in synagogues, and then some synagogues received them. Some of the Jewish people received them, but most of them kicked them out. We don't want to hear about this Jesus guy anymore. And so they were persecuted not only by the Romans, but by the Jewish people as well. And so uh, what does Jesus say to this church? What does he say? First thing he says is, uh, or he said, look at me. You feel persecuted? You feel weighed down by all that's going on with the world today? The virus, the vote, whatever gets you down? Jesus says, look at me. I am the first. I am the last. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and president of presidents. All right? Look at Jesus. Look at my eternality. I know everything. I know what's going on with you right now. I was dead, and now I'm alive. He knows what we're going through, whatever the persecution. Look at him. And the second thing he tells them is, remember this. I'm looking at you. Now, he tells every church this, those seven churches. Look at me. I'm looking at you. And he sees this suffering church, and they don't go unnoticed. And their affliction, in fact, that word affliction in the Greek literally means the burden that crushes like that myrrh. It takes you, it puts you in a crucible, and it just, you know. I read something about gold or precious metal. You know, you can, most of us, our persecution, our what we go through, we're all like gold, you know, we're sitting there and, and uh, our, our amount of persecution is sort of like somebody coming along and taking a scrub brush to us and cleaning us up on the outside, you know, to make us shine a little bit. That's the kind of persecution we like. We want to shine, but we don't want it to be too rough on us. The kind of persecution the Bible talks about is the kind that puts you in the fire and it melts out everything that's not Jesus. That's the kind of persecution Jesus is talking about. And at Smyrna, they were going through some of that. That crucible of persecution was grinding on them, and it didn't feel too good. And Jesus said, I'm, I'm, I see you. I, I know what's going on. Some of it's coming from uh, the... In fact, he called it the, the synagogue of the Lord has now become the synagogue of Satan. Satan will use any tool he can to mess with us. Jewish, we don't know what was going on there, but the Jewish tongues were wagging and wagging and wagging, you know, 
wagging on against the Christians. Probably, t in fact, uh, most of the early church, were, you know what they were being crucified for and burned at the stake and fed to the lions? And most of it came from the Jewish people who were telling the Romans, you know what these people believe? They believe, uh, they, they're cannibals. They believe in drinking blood and eating flesh. That's what Jesus talked about, didn't he? And, and, and they're atheists. They don't, they don't believe in all the gods. They just believe in this one God thing. Therefore, they must be atheists. Oh, they're, they're arsonists. They were blamed for uh, burning Rome, but actually, <laughs> probably it was Nero who did that. Or they, or they said they're, liber they're libertarians. They believe you can do anything and get away with anything, license to this. They don't believe in any laws. They just do your own thing. And all kinds of things are being railed against the Christians, taken out of context. Could happen in our day and time as well. And they were going to suffer. Could have been their business went under. Could have been their family <laughs> kicked them out. We don't know what all they were. But Jesus, he said, I'm, I see it. But you notice one thing Jesus never promised that suffering church is that it would end by him removing their poverty or by rebuking their accusers. This week I thought, you know, ah, God is on his throne, but boy, would I like him to come down here and kick some people, you know. He didn't promise to do that, does he? But he's watching. God is up, to Jesus at the right hand of the front. He's watching, waiting for the Father to say, that's enough, go get, you know. Go get him. He didn't promise this 2,000 years Later, you, you think, are we supposed to give up? Does it mean it's never going to happen? No, it means it's just that much closer. It's that much closer. But the suffering, he says, maybe I'm not going to end it. I'm sorry this doesn't sound like a health and wealth kind of sermon, you know. I promise you all, if you do this, then you're going to be blessed and everything's going to just fall into place. And, you know, it doesn't always happen like that. That pro probably more often than not, suffering is promised over this prosperity idea that we like to think about sometimes. But the point is, Jesus sees, he understands, and then thirdly, what are we supposed to do about it? Then we need to look ahead. And Jesus sees this suffering church, and, and they need to just look ahead. Hold on just a little bit longer, he said. Uh... He didn't say it's going to get better. Just hold on. Hold on. In fact, he said it's going to get worse. And so not only did they have local opposition, but they would have official persecution for 200 years over 10 different emperors. Many were headed to prison. Many did horrible deaths. But uh, all that persecution was not outside the hand of God. God knew what was going on. And finally he told them then, so because of that, look at this promise in verse 10 and 11. We can take comfort in the fact that if we lay our lives on the line, are you able, says the master, to be, and those guys said, yes, I'm really ready to go to, the, go to the death to follow you. And he said, it may come to that. He says, let him... Uh, who has an ear here, listen, you might experience the first physical death, and it may be bad, but you're not going to have to worry about the second death. This is what it's going to be for, for the suffering saint. You're going to be fearful, or are you going to be faithful? Are you, in the midst of this pandemic, think about it. Are we going to be bitter, or are we going to be better? Let's choose to be better. Let's choose to be full of faith. You know, the Christian at, at Smyrna, they had to decide whether to stand or not. Tradition tells us that it was in this church at Smyrna on February 22nd. I don't know, tradition. They got real specific. February 22nd 
in the year 155 A.D. That would be 60 years probably after this letter was written to Smyrna. Tradition says the imperial police of the Roman government came for Polycarp. He was one of the first, sec second generation Christians. Uh, John was probably the, one of the first, and then I believe Ignatius, and then Polycarp. He was in that first group of guys. They weren't around when Jesus lived, of course, but they were in the second generation after. They came for him. He was the bishop of the church at Smyrna, pastor of the church there. And he was brought before the Roman proconsul. And they demanded that he renounce Jesus or die. He'd already heard what Jesus said specifically to his church, the suffering church. And he decided to be faithful instead of fearful. And he paid for it with his life. More recently in our generation, I remember stories about Idi Amin holding a Ugandan believer up against a tree and just boom. We see pictures, we saw the pictures of the guys being beheaded on the, on the shores uh, there in Libya by ISIS. We're told the horror stories, you know, and, and, I, and I, was, I may have gotten it wrong one time, but I, I, there were more people killed in the 20th century for Jesus than the previous 19. But it's true that since the year 2000, there's been that many more killed in 20 years. And we sit by sometimes comfortably, you know, what can we do for them? What can we do for them? Well, we can certainly pray for them. Pray that God would give them strength in the midst of the persecution that so many of them are going through. Should we pray it never comes here? And sometimes I think maybe one of the reasons, well, so many slip off into eternity without Jesus. And often I think maybe it's because they don't have enough pain and suffering to make them realize that they need someone greater than their suffering. Jesus doesn't say he's going to take the pain away. But he does tell us to keep looking to him because he's looking at us. Look ahead. Look way ahead to the promise. We're going to have the crown one day. So much of what we have in our churches today, we worry about doctrinal heresy, we worry about backbiting, we worry about immoral living and things like that, and we should. The devil is going to do all he can to ruin our churches in America subtly. You know what I think would, <laughs> would really cause, you know what would fill this church up? Thinking about this part of Texas. It's for somebody to come in here with a gun and say, you meet, we shoot you. I really think it'd fill this place up. You know? When they start seeing somebody put a gun at somebody's head and pull a trigger, you want to do that? I think people would start coming out of the woodwork to go to church. And then some would run, run some would hide. We don't know. But I believe the church in America today could use a little bit of crushing, don't you? We've been so comfortable, so complacent, so long. Yeah, so take the best of the pandemic. Take the best of life as it's coming our way and, and, and use it to be better, right? Be better. To be full of faith, not full of fear. We don't know. It may come. We may suffer. You think you're suffering now? Jesus says, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> really? That's what he'd say. You ain't seen nothing yet. Could get worse. But he is there, and he's watching. He's watching. Father, we again thank you that you are on your throne, and you do see all. And you say to the persecuted church, hang in there. And there's no promise it might end in 10 days. It might be 10 years. It might be 
10 centuries before it happens, but it's going to have an end to it, and you are victorious. All the things that happen in Revelation chapters 4 through 22 about the future that haven't happened yet, they're going to start happening at some point. We don't know all the details. We don't know exactly how it's going to happen, but we do know that in the final analysis, the same paradise that the world began with in Genesis is going to end with it in Revelation 22. In between, we have no promise. We don't know what's, except that you're there. Father, may that be our prayer today, to look to you, trust you, believe in you, in Jesus' name, amen. You may have something you're, um, if you're full of fear, you need to come and pray about it. If you, if you feel like you're suffering, you need to come and ask for God's strength in the midst of it. You may, you may be here today without Jesus. If you don't know that you've experienced that second birth to avoid the second death, you need to come take care of that business. Let's stand together, and, and we are going to sing. Uh, mighty is the power of the cross. Mighty, mighty is the power of the cross. Something you need to do publicly today. We invite you to come. Tim and I will be here to receive you, but you come. Maybe something you just need to pray about today. Whatever. Come pray about the, the situation of the world, the pandemic. Pray for your pastor search committee. Pray for your staff. Pray for your deacons, but we invite you to come today. What can take a dime? Raise him up to life. What can heal a wounded soul? What can make us white as snow? can fill the emptiness, what can mend our brokenness, brokenness, mighty, awesome, wonderful, is the Holy Lord.
Father, I pray that we would experience uh, and take advantage of your power in our lives as we leave this place in just a few moments. Lord, help us to remember all you've done for us and just to look to you for every, every need this week. And we pray this in your holy name. And we all say together, please be seated for just a moment. You know, we're getting ready to show you this video. We're coming to uh, what I like to call crunch time on Operation Christmas Child. And uh, it's really, um, you know, we see all of this kind of happy uh, times with the kids and getting gifts. And but there's another aspect of this ministry that you're going to see in this video about the, these boxes going to the danger zones. Watch this real quick. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Many of the countries that we're working in, they're very hostile to the gospel. They're very dangerous places where these children are growing up. A shoebox gift can really be light in a dark place. Generally, uh, Operation Christmas Child is seen as a, as a fun, lighthearted project, but there's a whole other side of what we're doing. We go into places where a person can lose their life if you tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Thousands of Christians are forced to flee again, facing imminent execution. There were a number of civilian casualties. We're working with local believers who uh, face incredible opposition on a, on a daily basis. Many of our believers, our friends who follow Christ, are faced constantly uh, by interrogation, by secret police, investigation, uh, burning the churches down, uh, persecuting, even, even to the extent of death. I mean, everything is, um, is kind of discreet and hidden. It is dangerous, but God has given us ways. One of the ways is these shoeboxes. The believers are literally putting their lives on the line to share the gospel with the next generation. And we want to be able to help them do that through the power of a, of a simple shoebox gift. I have seen these boxes go into areas of the world where there's been war. And years later, I have had people come to me and say, I was a kid and you gave a box and it changed my life. It gave me hope. Thank you, thank you. Very good. In the midst of the, the challenges that these local believers are facing, we are seeing the church grow. And so uh, we want to continue to fan that flame, continue to have the opportunity to share the love of Christ. Pray for these boxes as they go to countries around the world. We need your help. Don't back off. We need your help. We need it now. What if what mattered most to you had to be a secret? What you heard that what mattered most to me had to be a secret. When I watched this video the first part of this week, I was just stunned and speechless. Uh, uh, hostile to the gospel, dangerous. People can be killed for loving Jesus. To the, these are the places that we go to. And, and, you know, there's so many people that can't send boxes, don't send boxes. But all the more reason why we heard from Franklin Graham, pray for Operation Christmas Child and all it's doing. We've got a lot going on with Operation Christmas Child today and this week because it's uh, um, uh, National Collection Week. And Tim's got more to share with you about what's happening this afternoon and tonight. Just want to continue to encourage you to, to get plugged in, help with Operation Christmas Child. As uh, Carrie had mentioned, uh, we have a group of students that are about to go shopping uh, this afternoon uh, and getting ready for our packing party tonight. It's not too late to give towards Operation Christmas Child if you'd like our students to shop for you. Uh, the only request is if it's a check, cash, whatever, that 
you at least tell me that you put in the offering plate so I know how much we're shopping with this afternoon. Uh, and so I encourage you to do that and let me know or you can give it directly to me and I'll make sure it gets where it needs to go. Uh, and so I uh, encourage you to do that. Uh, but the, the main thing tonight at 5 o'clock, there's no Bible studies, but we're serving. Uh, to, uh, this uh, Tonight across the street uh, in the Fellowship Hall will be our packing party. Uh, a great opportunity for all ages, uh, from little kids all the way up through senior adults to come and get be a part of uh, a great ministry that's taking place. We're hoping to pack at least uh, 300 boxes across the street tonight. And so what we need help. And so if you would like to help with that, uh, you don't have to sign up or anything. Just come at 5 across the street, and we'll give you direction on how to, how to do it and what we're trying to do, uh, all that kind of stuff uh, today. Great opportunity. If you, uh, I will say this, if you're going to do a box on your own, uh, we are re uh, taking those down towards Dallas on Saturday. So we need to make sure we try to get those back in probably to the church office by Wednesday. And so if you still have boxes that you're packing on your own, you can drop them by the church office. Feel free. We'll make sure they get delivered. Uh, also, lots of other things in the bulletin. Hopefully you got that. Check those things out uh, as you go. Grab one if you didn't get one, and uh, it'll inform you. But hopefully you'll see, we'll see you today at 5. Uh, like I said, if you want to continue to, to shop or help uh, our students shop today, come talk to me right now. So thank you all so much for being here. We'll see you all later tonight.